Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. In some places, the new school year has already begun. In many others, students are getting ready to head back into the classroom soon, some for the first time in a year and a half. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Dr. Carrie Altoff and Dr. Elizabeth Stewart of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Their topic, how to keep kids safe for in-person education this fall. Let's listen. Liz Stewart and Carrie Altoff, thanks so much for joining me. Great to be here. Great to see you, Stephanie. So uh, obviously summer has been in full swing, but we are headed back to school. Some places of the country have already gone back. And we're, we're seeing right now is we know how very important it is to send our kids back to school. They have really fallen behind. But at the same time, we're seeing the Delta variant uh, kick up more. We're seeing mask mandates in some places and not in others. We see older kids can be vaccinated and younger ones can't. Liz, how safe should we feel sending our kids back to school? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, we're in a more complicated situation than I think any of us were hoping we might be in, you know, a couple months ago. But I think big picture, we need to remember that we're still in a much sort of more knowledgeable and different place than we were last summer, let's say. And the thing that I like to think about in this context is back to this idea of layered mitigation strategies. So we have a number of tools in our toolbox They are all important, but each one also is not sort of the main thing. Um, And so I think families should really be thinking about these five things, vaccination, ventilation, masks, testing, and avoiding indoor crowding. And when thinking about sending their kids back to in-person schooling, should be thinking about how those different pieces fit and sort of are working at their school. Are there teacher vaccine mandates? Uh, Are the kids old enough to be vaccinated and are they? Has the building ventilation been improved? Are there mask mandates? Are kids and teachers wearing masks? So what kind of testing is possible to identify cases? And then what are the strategies to keep groups small, you know, and sort of things like lunch and, you know, assemblies and that kind of thing? Are, are there attempts to avoid large indoor crowds? Mm-hmm. It seems to me, Carrie, that we are in actually a worse position than we were last summer, where most of the kids ended up staying home when school started. So how do we go back now? So what we've learned with the kids being at home is that was really challenging for so many families. Um, Some families really did thrive in that environment. I'm not trying to say everybody um, was, was struggling. But I do think it's important to realize that we need to get the kids back in school. And the CDC has set that as a priority to get children back in school. And so what I think we have to think through is, okay, what can we do as parents to evaluate those five criteria that Liz just went through? And how can we be a part of the conversation with our schools and our school districts in order to be sure that they are hearing the voices of parents saying, the priority for me is my child's safety. So what are the strategies we're going to use to keep my kid not only at school, but in school? So we're not having children um, coming out on quarantine. I think the thing we have to remember is that it is not going to be perfect. It is not going to be the way it was in 2019 when kids went to school unmasked, without social distancing, without this awareness. We can't go there right now because we have not only COVID, but this new variant of COVID called Delta, which is highly infectious and kids are not exempt from from Delta. And so what we have to remember is in these populations where kids at 12 and under are totally unvaccinated, they're not eligible at this time, and where we have pretty low vaccination rates between children ages 12 to 18, We've got to keep these kids in schools, but we've got to use the tools that we have to keep them safe. 
Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about Delta real quick. I mean, it seems to me as though the actions of adults not getting vaccinated have made this particularly dangerous time for kids. How much are kids at risk? So unvaccinated children are just as at risk for Delta as unvaccinated adults. And because children 12 and under are a concentrated population of vaccinated. You know, Delta is looking for those populations because that's where the virus is going to be able to infect and jump from one person to the next. This is what viruses do, right? This is how they survive. And so right now, when we look at a more infectious version of COVID, this variant called Delta, we are seeing more and more children becoming infected. So the cases among children have really skyrocketed. And that has also resulted in an increase in hospitalizations among children with Delta. What we don't know at this time is if the virus itself is creating more severe disease in children. And that again is because we were expecting to see greater hospitalization numbers when we saw greater numbers of kids becoming infected. Even if the rate was still low, just by simple math, having a larger number of kids infected is going to result in more kids in the hospital. There are studies right now trying to answer this exact question, is Delta creating or causing more severe disease in not only children, but also adults. Liz, I know you have younger children who can't be vaccinated. How do you talk to them about going back to school? Yes, I have a, well, I have a 13 year old who is vaccinated and will be heading to eighth grade. And then a, a 10 year old who is of course not yet vaccinated. I'm anxiously awaiting uh, when he can be. You know, we, we, I think as a family talk a lot about safe behaviors and sort of doing activities that keep us all safe. He, though, I think is excited to go back to school. And so I think it's this balance of getting him excited to go back to school. But we do have a family sort of culture of mask wearing. You know, we have not stopped wearing our masks indoors, partly in solidarity with him, even for a time. As a vaccinated person, I might have gone into a store without a mask. Um, we never stopped that because he was still unvaccinated and it didn't feel fair for the two of us to walk into a store and, and me not have to wear one while he did. Um, so I think kind of keeping that family culture of, again, sort of choosing safe behaviors, being explicit about things like, you know, hey, at lunchtime, clearly you're going to have to take off your mask to eat, but, you know, be mindful about putting it back on quickly. I think sometimes adults underestimate kids and their resilience in this regard. You know, this is natural to him now. He had some time at summer camp and it's just what they all did. Um, and I think once they're in an environment, if the norms are clear and uh, sort of expectations are clear, the kids adapt. Um, and I think for him, it's going to be mostly this balance of kind of just getting used to being in a building again. And the masks, I think, will be incidental uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. What I'm concerned about, Carrie, is in some places, for example, we've all read about Florida where they're talking about, you know, banning mask mandates. And in Texas, they're not going to tell you if there's been an outbreak in your school. Those pieces seem very complicated to folks who live there. It's very hard to be confident in what's going on if you don't know if there's been an outbreak in your school. I mean, I know my my high schooler, my my older son, he was in uh, school in the in the spring and every week we'd get an email saying that the person on this team or that team had tested positive for COVID. And that's actually made me feel better because not, they were paying attention and they were trying to keep people away from sick children. How do we rationalize this in a place where they're not going to tell us? I'm not sure we really can rationalize it. And I'm not really sure we should. Um, we know that testing and monitoring helps to stop outbreaks quickly. So you don't have a bunch of kids missing school because they're all in isolation for an outbreak that wasn't contained. That is so important to keeping kids in school. So we have different ways and schools have gotten very, very good at communicating with parents while protecting the identity of individuals. And so that's key too, right? making sure that the, the case is, is reported to the parents and the, and the school community so they know what to be on the lookout for, but also not necessarily invading person's privacies, especially those who may be sick. The second part of this is you know, the idea that 
some choice has been taken away from schools and school districts with some of these state level mask mandates. And I think we have to really be critical of that because as we have seen with all of the recommendations, we are localizing the recommendations for what to do when transmission gets high or gets low in your environment, in your community, in your county. So state level mandates get really, really tricky because what could be going on in one county may be slightly different in another, especially in some of our states with a lot of geography and land mass. So I think what we have to remember is that having schools and school districts make choices based on what is going on around them, and that is all in alignment with CDC guidelines. CDC guidelines um, suggest maneuvering these mitigation strategies based on what's going on in the community. And that's really, really key to being able to control what we know will continue to be COVID outbreaks in schools until we can get to the place where all children can be vaccinated to reduce those outbreaks and get them stopped right away, keeping other children safe um, and keeping those who are infected uh, in places where they can be cared for at home. That's so important to really just prioritizing our children's health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And Liz, what advice do you have sort of to parents who say, you know, who hear this advice? Well, what's going on in your local community? You know, how is the spread there? I mean, there's so much information. Some of it's really good. Some of it's not. What's your advice to parents? I think a lot of it is this situational awareness that Carrie is referring to. Um, luckily, there still are reputable news sources that are you can find local data um, it, it is getting harder in some places, and that is incredibly disappointing. Um, but staying on top of the official counts in the area, and as Carrie mentioned, the CDC's uh, new school guidance has fairly uh, clear guidelines around sort of different levels of community transmission and what mitigation measures are appropriate for those. And so I really encourage families to keep an eye on that level of, of spread, whether it's significant, you know, high, and keep an eye then on is the school kind of modulating their mitigation responses um, in response to that. I also want to take the opportunity to remind all of the listeners that this spread that we're talking about isn't just about what happens in the school building. So we're talking, you know, there's a lot of conversation about safety in schools, but a lot of transmission, you know, potentially is happening in the community as well. And so I think families and really the entire community needs to take responsibility to avoid risky behaviors, large gatherings, especially large indoor gatherings, to, so that we can keep, you know, we, we don't want to be in those high levels of community transmission. We don't want the schools to have to have these high levels of mitigation strategies. And really, we all need to do our part in order to help those levels be lower um, so that the kids can be back in school in these sort of ways that might feel more natural to everyone. Carrie, I'm going to give you the last word. Things really do feel right now like they're getting worse. In many places, they're worse than they've ever been. Do you see us going back to virtual school or are we in this for this, you know, for the duration? I think that question is going to be answered based on what our actions are right now. We are seeing this spike. We are not out of the spike. <laughs> we, are, we are not there. And it is a steep surge. It is going up and up and up. And our actions right now, particularly as schools, are reconvening for in-person learning. We as communities have to support them. We have to do what our part is to help reduce the risk of transmission in those schools by reducing our likelihood that we could be infected and transmit to someone else. So getting vaccinated, absolutely. And right now, if you have persons in your household who are not vaccinated, wearing a mask when you go out as a vaccinated person is really important. So you don't bring COVID home and transmit to families. I mean, we know that in households, uh, transmission is, is very common of COVID. So making sure that you are doing your part to help keep kids in school. I don't think many school districts and teachers and families and parents are wanting to convert back to virtual school during the year. 
Um, I think there are a lot of families who are making the choice if, if they have the option to engage with virtual schooling if they are unable to, to do the face-to-face -face because it is too high risk for their family. And that choice is important, right? Because it is based on that family's health and well-being. But there aren't many people who don't recognize the disruption that is caused when you go back to virtual learning or when you flip forward. I mean, in my school district, we have four learning models in one academic year. It exhausted families. It exhausted the teachers. And so I think what we have to do is do everything we can to get these kids who really sacrificed a lot last year in most parts of the country by being at home for a lot of the year to help keep all the population safe and to help keep the death rate from getting any higher than it tragically was. So it's their time. It's their time this year to be back in school and as parents and as um, public health professionals and supporters of our schools and our communities, you know, this is our role. It's our job to help support them by getting vaccinated and during the surge, masking up. Carrie Altoff and Liz Stewart, thank you both so much for joining me. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.